we met at a small workshop in ARC in, in, uh, and then was talking in, in Belgium talking about uh, EU trade policy and had lots of things in common around trying to work out all these complicated dimensions of all these different aspects of trade and other uh, uh, government policies on development issues and so it's great to be here and have the chance to have a more extended conversation. So um, I'm not primarily a development expert and there are probably I'm sure people in the room with more of a development expertise than me. I come very much at this topic from uh, life as a practicing human rights lawyer originally, so practice as a human rights lawyer, and then I went and did a PhD looking at the intersections between human rights and trade. So I was exploring international human rights norms and international trade law norms, and this is how I got involved in, in thinking about human rights impact assessments, because there were all these UN bodies at the time, talking about how states needed to do human rights impact assessments of their international trade policies. And so I got involved in thinking about what those human rights impact assessments look like at a time when no one had done them, and then critiquing and commenting and working with people who were trying to undertake human rights impact assessments of trade agreements, and then from there, got, I was lucky enough to get involved in broader work where other people, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, asked me to do a uh, kind of um, a literature review of all the impact systems that have been, human rights impact systems that have been taking place across a wide range of fields, so children's rights impact assessments, women's rights, uh, corporate impact assessments, um, impact assessments of public spending decisions, all using this human rights framework, and that's taken me into lots of other different directions and, uh, and interesting work in human rights impact assessments in different fields. So, um, so I come at it very much as someone who's uh, critiqued other people's studies, the easy bit, written my own studies, the hard bit, um, and, and has been involved in lots of different roles in undertaking these and, and working with these human rights impact assessments. Um, so the danger of having been involved in all these different areas is you can say too much and go on for too long, so I'm going to limit myself to saying, trying to do six things in, in comments I'm going to make today. So first of all, and you should all have a little out, it's available at the front here, so you need to take away, so okay, you can go and grab one. Uh, <coughs> this is what I'm going to work through. Is... So what I'm hoping is, in a sense, this acts like a bit of a comfort blanket, so some of the things I'll be saying some of them will be technical and detailed, and this gives you the, the knowledge that you don't have to write anything down or think about it too hard. So, uh, and there are references at the end, actually, to a whole load of resources where you can read more about the kind of issues I'm going to be talking about. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce um, what we're talking about, the impact assessment and human rights impact assessment, and say a little bit initially about why I think this is relevant in the development context. Um, then say what the key rationales are for undertaking human rights impact assessments. Um, where has the main practice occurred, uh, number three, and then number four, what are the key elements in undertaking human rights impact assessment, so what is our understanding of this process and the elements that it involves. Five, what are the key differences between different types of human rights impact assessments, and then sixth, sort of thinking for the future about what we need to do in order to make this a positive tool from a development perspective in the future. So, first of all then, impact assessment. Uh, impact assessments, as I said on the front there, are an increasingly widely adopted tool for evaluating the effects of policies, programs, and regulatory interventions across a wide range of fields. So you can have a look at the International Association for Impact Assessment that has more than 60 or so streams of different impact assessments in different fields, environmental, social, regulatory, poverty impact assessment. Um, and we're focusing narrowly here today on talking about human rights impact assessment. And as Werner said in the introduction, it's the little baby in the family, as it were. But there's a, there's a, there's a big family with lots of, lots of other grown-ups um, populating it as well. So human rights impact assessments measure the impact of policies, programs, projects and interventions on human rights. And that's, again, a project that comes from the Human Rights Impact Resource Centre that contains many different materials on on, uh, on human rights impact assessment if you want to look in more detail. Um, and particularly relevant to the conversation we're having today, so human rights impact assessments have been utilised in a number of con contexts where there are clear and direct development issues, I think. So international trade agreements. You have many trade agreements between developed and developing countries, 
where those developing countries are making a signing up to a, low, a, a range of different uh, requirements, everything from liberalizing key sectors of their economy, like agriculture, to taking on intellectual property re um, uh, uh, regimes in these trade agreements, investment chapters, all of these have significant impacts on domestic development. So looking at those issues with the human rights lens can tell us, I think, important things about uh, the, develop the broader development context of uh, the, the, the agreements are being signed up to. Again, projects of multinational corporations, and Mark will talk a bit more in a bit more detail about that um, after I've finished, but, but, but uh, many of these projects and many of the human rights impact assessments of those projects have occurred in developing countries. So again, you've got multinational corporations going into many development contexts in developing countries, and the question is, what can this tool, Human Rights Impact Assessment, tell us about the nature of these projects and how they affect those developing countries? Um, we also have a range of other sort of government policies and programs where human rights impact assessments have, have, have taken place in, in developing countries where um, where uh, we, can, we can assess uh, from a human perspective what's happening. And I'll talk a bit more in detail about those as I go on. Um, so a range of different issues where, uh, where, 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 where human rights impact systems have been done in developing countries and also um, uh, human rights impact systems that have taken place, uh, for instance, in, in relation to government spending decisions, and many of those I've done myself in the United Kingdom, but across Europe, which could also have applications for development as well. I'll say a few things about those, uh, about that a bit later on. So I think lots of different areas where this tool has been used in the development context already, and we can learn lessons from that, or could be used in the future. And I think now is a is in the time that I've been looking at these assessments for a decade or so now, which is about the time of their kind of over the time over which most of the practice has happened. And we are now, right now, I think at a very key moment in, uh, in, in, in the history, the short history of this phenomenon. Um, they're increasingly important because of three different factors, I think. So one, the realization of the time and effort that's put into lobbying for them or undertaking them. Right? These are complex processes um, which are trying to assess from a human rights perspective complex phenomena, the trade aspects of international trade agreements and obligations, corporate big projects taking place in developing countries. So to, to be done well, they take time and effort. Um, so secondly, there's a changing dynamics about how they're being undertaken. Um, and here, let's see if these, I can get on to the second slide here. So this is a, this is a picture here of uh, the first uh, human rights impact assessment that I was ever involved in as an expert. Um, I was uh, involved with reviewing this, um, this assessment which looked at the impact of trade liberalization on the right to food of rice farming communities in Ghana, Algeria, and Indonesia. And that was for an, an NGO study done by a collection of um, civil society organizations looking at um, uh, the effects of trade liberalization on, from a right to food perspective in those three countries. Okay? And that was, uh, well, I was looking at that just about 10 years ago now. And at the time, that was very much where the practice was happening. It was very much a civil society activity, where civil society organizations were using these kind of human rights impact assessment tools to do a form of sort of scientific analysis from a human rights perspective to influence debates, to try and get, to try and make, in this case, make governments and international institutions like the IMF and the World Trade Organization change their policies by bringing this kind of evidence base into the, into the debate. I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Switch over to the other side in the less pretty picture because this is a, a corporate um, uh, um, Marshalls PLC. Have anyone heard of them? Anyone heard of Marshalls? I hadn't until I looked them up on the internet a couple of days ago. So I just do every now and then, now I do search for human rights impact assessment to see who's doing what. And at the moment there's just this explosion of activity. I mean more than I've ever seen before. So every time I do a new search I find a new company that is doing human rights impact assessment. So they say uh, in, this, in their China summary, delivering on its commitment um, to the UN Global Compact, Marshalls is, is engaged in, in, in year two of a four-year program undertaking human rights impact assessments across all the PLC's international operations. So Marshalls, I find out, is a cement making company. Right, so it's not like a big, it's not a, it's not a Google, it's not a, um, 
and an SO, or a VP or whatever, it's, it's something with, it's a company without a, a massive international presence, um, but one that has, it's, it's a multinational corporation that has operations all over the world, and they are, into, this suddenly, this human rights impact assessment tool is being used as a way of looking at their entire international operations. And what I'm going to say a few things about over the course of the next 35 or 40 minutes is how we've gone very much from this situation where human rights impact system, when I started off, was, a, was, was largely about pronouncements by UN bodies and a little bit of practice from civil society, to one where we've got a huge range of these impact assessments being done, not just by civil society actors, but by governments and by corporations. And that fundamentally changes the nature of the dynamic of how they're undertaken. So instead of being used as a tool from the outside to lobby for change, what we're seeing more and more is human rights impact assessment being used by, in a way, what you might say defensively, or in order to, to justify decisions that have been taken by a government or a corporation in relation to a project or a policy or a, or, or a new regulation. And what I suggest is that that changes the nature of the dynamic, but also means that we are at a place where it's very important that for those of you who are academics in the room, particularly, but others as well, we engage in what this terminology means, this human rights impact assessment. Because the danger is when all these actors are suddenly, there's this explosion of activity and studies going on, if we don't hold on, just like all names, all nomenclature, if you don't hold on and get a common sense of what we mean when we're talking about human rights impact assessment and the standards that it gives rise to, that it becomes meaningless, like sand running through your fingers. You can't get hold of the concept anymore because it's taken place in too many different ways, in too many different places, by too many different acts. So, uh, I'll come back to talking a bit more about that towards the end of what I've got to say. But first of all, let's go back to the second thing is to say what are the key rationales for undertaking human rights impact assessment. Um, and the first one that I've left off, I think, because to my, my head is so obvious because I've been involved in it so long, but it probably isn't obvious to everyone in the room, is, is complexity. I'm torturing a prisoner. There is a clear human rights violation there, right? We don't need to do an impact assessment in order to take action, campaign, court cases, whatever it might be. But a lot of the kind of development situations that I've flagged up and talked about, if you talk about the impact of trade liberalization on farmers' rights in, in um, small farming communities in Ghana or Honduras, so large-scale international regulatory regimes, small farming communities, the relationship between those two, or corporate operations in different places around the world and how they're affected. Those are complex situations, right, where the, where the human rights impacts of those um, policies, programs, laws, regulations are not obvious. So we, we undertake human rights impact, impact assessment where there's some complexity there and we want to analyze what's going on. But then what's the rationale for doing human rights impact assessment? And I want to say two things, one from the development perspective, so what might be the advantage of, uh, from, from my knowledge, um, undertaking a specifically human rights perspective uh, in, in doing the impact assessment work. And then secondly, what are, the, what are the advantages or rationales from the human rights perspective itself? Okay. So, and I've given you some different quotes from different authors on the bottom of this page here who, who have talked about these different rationales. Uh, and there's a guy there called Simon Walker, who's done one of the best studies of uh, an international trade agreement. He's looked at uh, the in in intellectual property regime and the Central American Free Trade Agreement and its impact on access to medicines. Uh, and he's, in part of that study, he says, human rights impact assessments utilize a set of norms and standards that are based on shared and distinct values and therefore represent a solid normative foundation on which to base impact assessment. So there is some sense in which we have a set of human rights um, provides a framework um, uh, that is more more solid than other forms of impact assessment and does different things. So it's based on a set of international legal obligations that are entrenched in international agreements, and I won't go into that because I've seen everyone in, in the room is, is, is familiar. But from a more philosophical perspective, what we have is what I would call a deontological system of justice. Deontological system of justice. So what human rights do is create rules of action. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not torture. Okay? 
which are not based on consequences of what happens after, but are saying these are prohibitions about, about um, types of behavior that affect the human individual. And if we think about some of the other things we're talking about, so trade agreements, corporate activity, very much, if you look at the, the ethos behind those kind of activities, they are, they are, they're generally consequentialist in nature. So justifications around global capitalism, around international trade policy, tend to be consequentialist. Do this and the consequences will be increased growth, prosperity over time. So human rights framework looks like a really interesting way of critiquing some of these policies and programs from a very different perspective. And an example of this, I just want to get, can, we, can you read that? Is that? This is um, just a, so um, the EU does sustainability impact assessments of uh, all its international trade agreements that are negotiating with third countries. And this was um, just a, a very brief extract from a sustainability impact assessment um, that was undertaken in relation to WTO negotiations in the agriculture sphere. Okay? So uh, what this says is, uh, as the costs of adjustment fall predominantly on producers, um, they will fall predominantly on rural areas. As small semi subsistence producers tend to be less competitive, they are likely to lose domestic market share to imports, whereas commercial producers are the most likely to be able to respond to increased competition. Some losses among domestic producers are likely, although there is no strong reason to believe that adverse effects will be more severe for smallholders, who often display remarkable resilience, than for larger, more commercial farms. That, to me, looks deeply problematic from a human rights perspective, right? Because what that's saying is, we don't need to do any more analysis than this, okay? We've, we've, we've identified an overall economic uh, impact here, but we're not going to do anything in order to differentiate, really, in any meaningful way, between these smallholders and these large commercial farms. And if we were adopting a human rights perspective, we would want to say, well, what, does it, what, is it, what do the impacts look like here for these small farms? Um, and we would want to study that in some detail. And so the... the uh, Oh God, I'm not going to read that one. <laughs> what says back there? Yeah, this one, yeah. Is that the one? Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> that help in translation. So this report here looks very different. So if you look at this, this human rights impact assessment of an international trade agreement, then doesn't just look at the overall impact, for instance, of trade liberalisation on Ghana, but goes into those farming communities and looks at how their differentially impacted small farming communities, small communities, growing rice by imports from abroad. And so you have just a completely different methodological approach which disaggregates impact and particularly